Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we've got Tyler with us. We're talking about praying like monks and living like fools. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this program. We have got Tyler with us. We have very much looked forward to this interview. Loved his book. Read it. uh, Man, eight months ago it feels like six months ago something like that and uh, me and my wife both cried uh, a couple times so it'll be a tearjerker today very excited about it uh, for those of you who are watching you don't know much about remnant you want to stay tuned to all the different things that we do we've got courses conferences uh, and we have a lot of content that we have up on patreon if you want to be notified when we come out with new stuff like that you should subscribe to the newsletter it can be found at the remnant radio.com also a link can be found in the description without further ado i'm going to just toss it over to my partner in crime michael roundry how are you doing over there michael I am doing really well over here in the Oklahomas and excited to interview Tyler about living, uh, praying like monks and living like fools. We might have you explain that title to us here in a minute. But even before that, Tyler, just introduce us to yourself, your ministry, tell us a little bit about what you do, and maybe you could kind of transition that to telling us about your book and why you titled it this way. Yeah. Um, my name is Tyler Staten. I live in Portland, Oregon. I am the husband to Kirsten and the father to Hank, Simon, and Amos, uh, seven, five, and two. I lead a church called Bridgetown Church, and uh, I also get to serve as the national director of 24-7 Prayer in the USA. And I've gotten to write a couple of books uh, the, the latest book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, is, is all about the topic of prayer. The, the attempt was to, uh, you know, in the subtitle, I talk about the wonder and mystery of prayer. It was an attempt to kind of gather together the incredible color palette that is the practice of prayer throughout church history and offer it in a, a deep but accessible way to the everyday Jesus follower today while also addressing some of the questions that tend to silence or stall uh, our prayers along the way as we work out life in relationship to God, primarily through the spiritual practice of prayer. So that's the brief intro. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Okay, Josh, I was going to yield the first question to you, but, you know, sometimes... Tyler, just so you know, Josh likes to about once a show, put the camera on me when I'm expecting it to be on him just for an awkward moment. Excellent. He, I also really- randomly mute Michael when he's talking. It's also a, a very fun practice that I have. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're so unprofessional. Josh okay, go really relishes being in control. <laughs> it's yeah, too much I fun. see that. It's too much yeah. fun. Yeah, it it really comes back to our theological debates over uh, predestination and things like that, but we won't go there. Uh, Let's talk about prayer. So you talk about in your book, uh, prayer as encounter. And so uh, talk through some of like the deep transformation. You told a story about when you were in high school, I guess it was high school, just you were in school growing up and and, uh, maybe you could even tell us that story to give context for how this shapes your view of prayer and how we can pray in a, in a way that um, impacts us and impacts the world around us. Just uh, do, you, do you know what story I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. yeah when I was uh, 13 years old, I was going into the eighth grade. My uh, youth pastor challenged me with the question, Tyler, what do you think God would do in the lives of your lost friends at school if you were to prayer walk a circle around your middle school every day of summer break with their names on your lips in prayer. And I said, I have no idea. Um, But I really liked that experiment because I was, uh, I'd grown up within the church. I'd had a lot of sincere and very real experiences, but I was also a very inquisitive kid. I think I've always been, um, or I hope I've always been a thoughtful person. And so um, I was aware that all of my formative experiences with God had been very much uh, 
within large groups and curated by religious professionals, you know, just to put it as, as bluntly as I can, I guess. And I loved the idea of giving God a chance to surprise me or disappoint me. Um, and of seeking God in a way that was not curated, um, but was just me alone, um, seeking relationship to my creator. And it's funny, the question that originally prompted that invitation, which I did over the course of that summer break, go to my middle school every single day with a copy of my student directory in hand back when they would give you everyone's phone number and address who was in your eighth grade class, a very different time in history uh, than right now. Um, but the original prompt um kind of faded to the background as the days went on throughout that summer. And while I still did pray that my friends would know Jesus, I I discovered myself just kind of walking and talking with Jesus. And I think the, the great discovery of that summer wasn't um wasn't that I really needed God in an ultimate sense. That was always true, but that I really liked God and enjoyed his company. And I was suspicious that he enjoyed mine and that I felt most at home in conversation with him in prayer where, where I knew his presence. And then, you know, I, I fell in love with God uh, alone on prayer walks. I actually think of that as as my salvation moment uh, more prominently than any other time. There were other significant moments in my spiritual development, but it was then that I decided to follow Jesus and that I counted the cost and and dropped my nets, so to speak. And so I, I came back to school, started a Christian outreach program in my public middle school the next year and, and ended up seeing, uh, you know, a approximately 10 to 20% of my eighth grade class come into relationship with Jesus over the course of that next school year. Mm. Um, and the, the middle school outreach program I started began in a math classroom with like a couple of people. And by the end of the school year, it was the largest extracurricular program in that school. And we're meeting at 6 30 AM on Wednesday mornings in the school's theater. And it was just a bewildering answer to prayer um, and a total transformation in me that led to transformation in my school. And, and I did, honestly, you know, we could go into the details of the story, but I think I would just suffice it to say that in terms of starting a, a ministry or an outreach, I did absolutely everything wrong. I had Praise God. Um, no, no savvy plans or anything like that. But what I did see, um, was just a God who is eager to answer prayers of people who will seek him earnestly. And so I think I encountered both the intimacy of prayer and the power of prayer over the course of my life as a 13 and then 14 year old. And I would say that the wonder of that relationship has never left me. I have gone through many ups and downs in my own life of faith as we do, um, as we walk the narrow way behind Jesus. But Never have I lost that initial feeling of the most adventurous, lively, true way to live is in closest relationship to God as I possibly can walk. Hmm. Mm. Amen. Charlie, this, the story is, uh, it's, it's eerily similar to a story I had when I wasn't in middle school. Um, I was 17. Uh, I caught a BB in my right eye and I was blind in my right eye for uh, a couple months. And so I'm 17. I'm planning on enlisting in the military. I know that like I'm going to turn 18 soon, um, but I'm going to be blind. So I can't enlist during this period. My youth pastor convinced me, hey, you should take a semester with me in Bible school. So I'm, I'm thinking I should use some fire insurance, right? So like I'm in, in the Bible school and he's encouraging us to do these outreaches in these schools. And I just start praying for the students in the school until like I have to like show up at the school earlier and earlier and earlier to pray for them. And like, and I get kind of tricked into just spending time with the Lord, you know? And it feels like that. It feels like I was just, I just wanted to pray for mm -hmm. others and I got tricked into this thing of intimacy. Um, but I'll tell you that there was probably a bunch of hangups I, I had. And I think hangups that a lot of people have when it comes to 
um, the newness of it all. Like, what do you say when you pray? Like, I don't have long conversations with God and he doesn't really talk back when I'm talking to him uh, or it doesn't feel like he is. There's there's silence there. There's a fear that maybe I'm praying for my own motives, my own desires. Um, how did you navigate through that? How would you encourage others to navigate through that? Um, it, it can be a difficult thing as you're kind of starting your journey in prayer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think I would answer that in maybe a frustratingly practical way and just say, whenever you're getting to, well, let let me back up a second, actually. It's very important that we understand prayer in the context of relationship. Many people have a default posture of relating to prayer um, in a way other than relationship, like as a means to an end or a, uh, a, a practice they should be doing. We don't really want to be doing almost like, I don't know, a, a book that you find particularly boring, but you know, is going to be enriching to you over time or something like that. So prayer is a discipline. Um, prayer is a, a down payment on an investment or something like that. But fundamentally, as we see in the life of Jesus, prayer is relational. And so in relationship, whenever you're getting to one new, it, it can be really helpful to the conversation to kind of have a few conversation topics that you know you want to get to um, before you sit down, not to just sit down with a blank slate and then suddenly be like, oh my gosh, what should I ask this person? Or what should we talk about? Um, But of course, the hope is that those conversation topics become a springboard to just this free-flowing conversation that you kind of lose yourself within. And I think we should aim our prayers in the same way. Like it can be helpful if you're just getting started in the way of prayer to think about what are the major buckets of my life that if there is an infinitely loving and all powerful God eager to hear and respond to me, which I believe there is, then what are the sorts of things that I might want to start talking to that God about and, and to kind of have almost like a, a plan for that conversation and to be okay with the fact that the conversation feels a bit planned for a time, but then to know that as you become more at ease in the company of God, just as you become more at ease in the company of another person, that your conversation with God, your comfort with silence with God, um, your comfort with listening to God and trying to discern his voice, all of these things are going to become much more natural to you until prayer is as natural as breathing, just as conversation with the people that you know deepest and have known longest um, becomes that natural. Amen. Okay, so as you're talking about prayer as a conversation, I can imagine that a lot of people are watching or listening to this and they're thinking, I would love for prayer to be a conversation, but prayer is really like I'm talking and it's silent on the other end. And so... Maybe you could talk to uh, to us through maybe two things. The on, on one side, what do you do when God is silent? Like in the kind of big picture silent moments of life, like in the psalmist, why have you forsaken me? Uh, you know, where are you, God? How long? So maybe dealing with that. But then you talked a lot about just kind of like everyday conversation. And, uh, mm-hmm. and so I, I'm thinking like, so that not just like those big moments in life where you're like just waiting and you're desperate, but also just in the everyday prayer. And what does conversation even mean? Is he giving you like visions and downloads and revelations? Or do you have a sense in your spirit of what he's saying to you? So the the overall theme of the question is, is what the dialogue portion of this looks like rather than just prayer as a monologue. Yeah, maybe we could come back to the first question, the big question about the silence of God and just start on the dialogue side of things. Um, I think that prayer for most people starts with talking at God, but the aim of prayer is to mature beyond talking at God to talking with God. And that, that requires discerning an everyday awareness of God's presence to me, and his voice in my life. And I would say that that does occasionally include download revelation, 
but that would certainly be the minority, not the majority of the experience. Um, most of the time, as Paula de R.C. famously said, God comes to us disguised as our ordinary life. And it is simply learning to live attuned to God in the everyday life that I'm living today, which may sound like a little bit of a bananas idea as uh, d- depending on your outlook on life, but maybe it would be helpful just to first of all remind you uh, that to call yourself a follower of Jesus is to fundamentally believe that an invisible kingdom that outlasts everything within the visible world that I see today and, and renews it all from within is invading this place even now through the lives of those who call themselves Jesus followers and therefore have been indwelt by his spirit, like the very presence of Jesus dwells within me for the sake of intimacy and resurrection power and the renewal of all things. That's the story of the Bible. And so if I believe that story, to believe that God is making his appeal to me and is walking with me through the ordinary events of my every day, and that conversation with God is therefore invited through everything that, that I'm experiencing all the time actually follows quite naturally. And, and the way that I think you bring those massive theological concepts and ground them in an everyday life is just to have a prayer life that includes as much practice of listening as it does speaking. So for me, um, my personal practice of prayer looks like this. In, in the morning, um, I sit down on this chair on my porch, which is where I spend time with God each morning. And I light a candle that sits next to me that just helps me kind of transition to this candle represents God's presence to me that is here all the time. But as I light it, I'm kind of trying my best to begin setting everything else aside. I set a timer for 10 minutes on my phone, um, so I'm not checking or trying to monitor the time. I open my hands on my lap in front of me and I pray, come Holy Spirit. And then I just wait in silence. And then, of course, like my snow globe imagination starts, you know, I start remembering everything I've forgotten to do and everything I need to get done and all that kind of stuff. And just each time I find my mind wandering, I just pray again. I just simply name Holy Spirit as sort of an anchor to draw my mind back. This is called a, a breath prayer, um, which is a practice that goes down throughout Christian history. And I think of this as giving God the first word of my day. And sometimes in that time of silence, God will bring up a memory or a verse of scripture or um, uh, a word will pop into my mind that immediately connects to something I've got going on in my life that I feel I'm drawing my attention to. Um, And other times, nothing will happen at all. I will simply fight distraction for a little while and offer God my attention as best as I'm able. And then the the timer will sound. And then I open up the scriptures and I read a psalm and another passage of scripture. And then I take a walk. I I pray best while walking. Everyone's different. Um, But I'm so distracted when I just sit in one place and try to talk to God. But if I walk as I'm talking with God, I find that conversation is able to flow out of me much more honestly. And the first words of my prayer every day are, Jesus, today I hear you talking to me about. And I just recount what I've heard him say to me in the silence or through the the written word of scripture. And I view all of my praying life in response to what God has first said to me. So I just offer that practice, not as a prescription, but as one example of if if you have a prayer life that doesn't include as much listening as it does talking, it's going to be difficult for you to mature uh, into any type of dialogue relationship with God because you're only practicing monologue with God. And so just as we were talking a minute ago about how, uh, you know, a planned conversation can flow into effortless conversation over the course of time, so can a planned time of listening flow into effortless listening as you go about your day over the course of time. And there's also a a historic prayer practice called the examine that comes from the Ignatian tradition prayed typically at the end of the day or in the evening, which is also a practice of listening 
by reviewing your day in the presence of God, which can be helpful too if you find prayer more natural in the evening. But I would simply say that we, we have to structure lives of practice for dialogue with God if we're going to live into that to that uh, reality. Hmm. Okay. I, I'm I'm curious if you uh, use imagery at all, like um, you mentioned kind of a kind of like a, a, a breath like prayer where a hey, come Holy Spirit is a kind of way to cleanse your mind. Do you ever try to fill your mind? I mean, well, maybe maybe I'm actually putting words in your mouth. Are you trying to empty your mind as in um, some people would go, well, it sounds like Eastern meditation. I don't think it's the same. Like it's it's like having a conversation with a person. If you're interrupting them as they're talking, it's just kind of rude, you know, so like you just like create space for someone else to speak. Um, but simultaneously, I guess the other question would be then one is it is it like eastern meditation which would be emptying yourself emptying your thoughts but then two are you do you ever fill your mind with the knowledge of god you know i think of the incarnation the crucifixion the exaltation sitting at the right hand of the father the images of scripture that were actually given and are described uh, are those fruitful in that process of cultivating relationship and intimacy and prayer absolutely yeah it, it's it's the furthest thing from Eastern meditation um, in, in two senses. One is uh, what you're pointing to. You're not emptying your mind. You're filling your mind up with Christ. And, and what I'm describing, I'm not trying to empty my mind of the cares of my life. What I'm trying to do is direct my attention to the deeper desires within my life rather than the surface level concerns and demands. Uh, the, the human condition is such that... Um, you know, I, I care so much more about the kind of father that I become than this week's grocery list. But this week's grocery list uh, will pop into my imagination much more freely than the kind of father that I'm going to become. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that that's a human condition that can be applied to anything. Um, I, I think... So much of the task of prayerful awareness of God is simply getting in touch with the deep longings that I have and holding them before God who can bring them to fulfillment by his grace, um, which I cannot do just by gritted teeth and best intentions. I know me well enough to know that. Um, and so I'm not trying to empty myself of concern. I'm trying to get in touch with that which lives deepest, but is often caked under the dust of the everyday, more trivial concerns. And then the second thing I'm doing is absolutely trying to root myself in the biblical story, in the circumstances of my life today. Um, so let me give you just a, a very real life example of what I'm of filling my mind as, as I'm praying through silence. Um, We've just wrapped up uh, the season of Lent where the global church for 46 days uh, identifies with the suffering and temptation of Christ. And I uh, am currently in a, in a cancer battle and am in the midst of some really intense, uh, really challenging chemotherapy treatment that has me very ill a lot of the time. And so during this time, I haven't been using... Holy Spirit as a breath prayer, I've been using, I want to know Christ, um, which is Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ, to know him in the power of his resurrection and identification with him in his sufferings, becoming like him in his, uh, in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And I just have this little breath prayer to remind me that when I feel earthly suffering in my body, there's an invitation there to intimacy with Jesus, that Jesus knew what it felt like to seek God in the midst of an ailing and suffering body, and that Jesus was a miracle worker, a miracle working healer, and yet his greatest healing came through redemptive suffering and not through uh, miraculous deliverance from suffering. And so I... Uh, find there a place of intimacy with God that I can fill my mind up with as I begin each new day so that rather than trying to escape my pain, I'm asking Jesus to redeem my pain just as Amen. his pain was redeemed through resurrection life. His resurrection life would well up in me because I want that more than I want to not feel sick today. I want to know him in his suffering, his resurrection. So I think 
those are absolutely like, and that's why it's important that I, I was pairing scripture with prayer. We've got to be well versed right. in the biblical story. If we're going to like set our feet down in healthy practices of listening to God, like the ones I'm talking about. That's wonderful. Amen. Well, so Tyler, you just mentioned your cancer diagnosis and thanks for opening up to us a little bit about that and how you're processing that in terms of your routine. Um, I want to come back to the question that, you know, I, I was a little tricky there in asking, you know, packing two questions into one requiring you to remember them both, which is always like kind of annoying. But uh, I want to come yeah. back to the question on the silence of God and just to ask you, as you've, uh, as you've walked through this, you know, a lot of people when they go through a time of intense suffering, they feel like God is silent in that suffering. Have you felt that way or have you felt like God continues to speak to you? I mean, the, and then you, you also have the other side. Sometimes people feel like God draws ever nearer in the midst of suffering. So it, if maybe we could even get a little personal here, how has, uh, ha, has the silence of God played into your suffering or do you feel even closer to him? Kind of how, how is that... Uh, I guess, how are you processing that? Yeah, I would say that in this experience of suffering for me, I'm having the ever nearer experience. And um, I think for me, just to be very personal and uh, yeah, just to, to be transparent, I think that my personality structure and the circumstances of my life to date would be that I have gone further in knowing God's love through partnership with him through performance and doing than I have just through being. I've known God in my strength more than in my weakness, maybe. Um, and right now I just feel so limited and weak. I feel so incapable of being who I've gotten used to being um, physically, relationally, vocationally. Um, and I have felt so loved by God, both personally when I'm alone and through people in a way that I just wasn't available to be loved before because I was so excited about all the projects me and God had going on together. And I don't mean that in a trivial way. I mean, like, I think God loves to partner with me in the redemption of the world and the redemption of my own soul. And yet here I am, I think having um, an experience, maybe like what Peter knew on the beach as he was restored by Jesus, you know, where it's like, I, I thought that you recruited me to your team so that we could together like pull your kingdom down to earth and he's discovering peter's not just um restored from his denial on the beach he is like made uh through his denial you know like the redemption is so comprehensive that the peter that we know um just doesn't come together if he doesn't first fall apart and discover how weak he really is and therefore how loved he really is in the midst of his weakness mm -hmm. in a way that has nothing to do with the fact that he's the guy who's willing to walk on water or whatever else. And, mm -hmm. and so I would say, I feel like I'm in that kind of moment where this is hard for me. This is uncomfortable for me, but God has access to parts of me um, that only prolonged weakness would give God access to. And that has been the gift that I did not know I needed so badly and the one I'm trying to savor. And so I've actually found it easy to not think constantly about the finish line and the outcome and think, well, maybe, you know, when, at, when the last round of chemo is over, I'm going to do this for fun and I'm going to feel good again. And, you know, but instead to just live each day and say, you know what, what God is doing within me now, I want every last drop of it. So when this time of suffering comes to an end, I just hope that everything that God wanted to, to do within me in the midst of this, he's gotten to do. And I don't have some whacked out theology where I think God like willed my cancer or something like that. Sickness is a, is a consequence of sin. 
you know, this is like not the world God created, but this is the way that he's taking what the enemy attempted for evil and is using it for good in my life right now. Um, and then um, maybe just to give a, a theological motif or a place that's, that I'm God's meeting me in scripture through that would be, um, I, I find it really interesting that the word refuge in the biblical story is used only in relationship to geography until the wilderness Psalms of David. So refuge is only a literal place that people go to, to find safety um, uh, in the actual physical world until David's wilderness Psalms were 37 different times in the Psalms. David names God refuge. And so there was something about his seven years in the wilderness that David discovered that when he's exposed, when he is hunted, when he is alone, when he feels forgotten, when the anointing of king that God promised him is taking far too long to come about, and how can these seven years of wandering be a part of the story? He discovers that God is his safe place, that God is his hiding place, that God is his shelter, even in the wilderness. And that's that's the kind of discovery that we have to live in the wilderness in order to make and so I would say that's that's been my experience in prayer during this time. It's just discovering maybe just a tiny snippet of David's discovery of God as refuge. Hmm. I, I'm um, I'm kind of reminded as like the, the that father motif. I, I use this illustration when I talk about prayer sometimes. But um, the, the, my dad was a mechanic and he had you know worked on planes. He had these big beefy arms. And he'd get home and I'd wrestle with him and then I'd jump up in his lap and I'd feel his arm, you know? And uh, the very next thing that a kid does every time they feel dad's arm is that they flex, like no matter how string beanie they are, there's something about their strength, that mm-hmm. make, their dad's strength that makes them feel strong. And um, anyway, I, I, I wonder if you could just maybe take a moment to unpack God as father for us as it relates to prayer. Um, certainly in, in relation to um, the prayer that we're commanded to pray. And we, we pray in our church every every Sunday, which is, um, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, that, that bit. Uh, Matthew 6, could you maybe unpack a little bit of the God as Father motif as it relates to prayer? Yeah, I think there's a dual invitation there, uh, just in that the way that we address God in the Lord's Prayer. One would be, the absolute scandal of knowing God with the intimacy of a child, knowing his Abba. Um, and Jesus kind of attaches two things to that. One would be, I think, the the free relationship of a child to come just as they are, to uh, relate to God as freely as, as the image you just gave us of, of grat, like crawling into your dad's arms, wrestling him, that kind of thing. Um, particularly in Jesus's context, you know, there was a much more formal relationship to God, the name that was prescribed to God um, throughout the Hebrew Bible, or what we often call the Old Testament in the um, American churches, uh, Yahweh, a name so holy uh, that we can't spell it. We don't know exactly the way to say it. Um, And, and yet Jesus replaces that with the most intimate title that was known at his time. And so I think Jesus is not sacrificing any of the sanctity of God, but he's pulling all of that sanctity into the most intimate place, which is such a beautiful invitation. And then he says that the type of father God is, is the sort that loves to give good gifts to his children, um, which is, I think, this free invitation to ask God for everything that you need and that you want. Like I mentioned, I have three little boys. My middle son, Simon, is the most motivated by sugar person I've ever been around in my life. (laughs) And he asks me every day if we can have dessert tonight, every single day. And um, I love saying yes. I don't always say yes, but I love saying yes because his face lights up with fresh expectation every day. Like, could we have dessert tonight? And it's the greatest outcome of the day <laughs> you could expect. And, and so I think that, I think that's a, like, that is the sort of good gifts to his children posture that God has toward us. And that's the picture that Jesus is painting. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, I think is a maybe even greater challenge 
uh, for the everyday modern American, because to know God as father is also to know myself as helpless. And in my experience, helplessness fuels prayer. Um, and let me give a practical example of what I mean by that. I, um, in, in my first decade of marriage, I didn't pray a whole lot about my marriage. Um, I, I prayed a whole lot about the church that I was leading, the friends that I had, the ways I saw God working, the ways I saw his kingdom coming. But I didn't pray a whole lot about my marriage. My wife and I weren't the couple that does like a morning prayer routine together. And we just, that, that just kind of wasn't how it worked for us. And we would always explain that. And in hindsight, I would say it's because we weren't helpless Like we basically thought we kind of knew what to do. Like conflicts will arise Mm. occasionally and we'll communicate honestly and in a healthy way and we'll work those things out and we'll keep going together. And then we got to year 13 and just found that, oh man, over the course of time, resentments have built up and we've developed maybe a way of seeing and relating to each other that is, that is uh, not defined entirely by grace and we don't actually know the way back to the way that we want to know and relate to each other just all on our own and our healthy communication and working it out is insufficient for the sort of marriage that we want to cultivate together. And that's when we started kneeling at the foot of our bed every morning and praying together to see one another and know one another through eyes of grace each day because we finally became helpless to actually cultivate the sort of relationship that we wanted to have. And so I would say... Uh, if you want to know where you're believing the serpents lie, that you can be like God, just look for the part of your life that you're not finding the need to pray much about. And that's probably where you are believing the lie that you are helpful and not helpless and receive Jesus's invitation to not only know God as father, but then therefore to also know yourself as helpless child I hope people are wearing their steel-toed boots, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was that was both encouraging, but then also extremely corrective at the same time. It's so exposing to go, oh yeah, yeah. I I I think I'm all that I'm in a bag of chips. About that thing, very much. Yeah, totally. I I, I kind of need to meditate on that a little bit. That's uh, that's great. Um, okay, so you talk about helplessness as being really a key ingredient in prayer. Uh, but I know in your book, you also talk about the importance of stillness, which is a challenge in American culture where we're busy, 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 or Western culture. I know not all of our viewers, of course, our viewers come from all over the world, but in Western cultures, we just tend to be busy. We're always uh, looking at this right here. Every spare moment, I got 15 seconds in the checkout line. I have 15 seconds. I can check my phone again. And this is awesome. I can fill every spare moment with activity. So, So talk to us about stillness, the importance of it. And how living in a chaotic Western culture, you actually make space for stillness. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is what we were touching on before with the some type of regular practice of listening um, it is a way to make space for it. But stillness is is so vital to spiritual and emotional health. Um, and, and we're going to need to have a number of different practices of stillness. But the main reason is, is for what I was saying before, it's just nearly impossible to actually live in touch with deep desire apart from some type of regular stillness where, where you can allow the dust to settle on your life a little bit. And I would say that so much of the battle of the spiritual life is to pull the deep desires of the human condition up and then live in touch with them for a long period of time. Um, Because of similar examples to I gave before, but just maybe as a reminder, um, my, you know, we're just talking about my marriage. I care so much more about the marriage I'm going to cultivate over the next 50 years than this Sunday's sermon. But this Sunday's sermon is a pretty large vocational task for me. That's going to occupy my mind a whole lot more. Uh, for the remainder of this week than the type of marriage that I'm cultivating. And so how do I, in the midst of the demands of this week's vocational work, 
choose to prioritize the marriage that I'm cultivating in the way that I listen to my wife and the quality time we spend together and everything like that, that's going to require me to be able to live and touch with the deeper desires that the spirit of God can point me to and put me in touch with uh, in the, the events and days and moments that I have to live this week. And stillness is the place that God can kind of move around the priorities and pull the levers of my life. Um, And then secondly, I would just say um, that a second reason we have to practice stillness is because prayer is a slow, focused conversation. And every force in our world trains us to be incapable of that. So, you know, if I just look at my phone every time I want to, or if I uh, can't, you know, pump gas or wait for a friend to go to the bathroom at a restaurant without distracting myself with news or entertainment, that's telling me something about my inability to remain present with an, another person or a moment for any given period of time. And that will fundamentally make prayer difficult for me for reasons that aren't overtly spiritual, but are simply about my own emotional and intellectual training. Like I'm discipling myself to be an unprayerful person. Um, and so practices of stillness just have to be very practically helpful in equipping us with the basic tools for developing a rich and deep prayer life. Um, So in my life, what that looks like is a daily practice of listening stillness and an evening practice of examine um, by which I repurpose my commute on the way home uh, rather than filling it with noise or the radio or a podcast or something. I fill it with this slow practice of prayer. And then I also have a weekly practice of stillness where I spend an hour uh, in silence kind of allowing at the pace that it just comes, allowing myself to sort of surrender the week back to God. And that usually starts with like, I always do this on like a hike, run or a walk. So I do it while I'm moving, but I don't have headphones in or anything. And it's at least an hour. And the first 30 to 40 minutes, I'm usually not saying anything or trying to think about anything intentionally. I'm just kind of walking. And I guess like, my my brain is almost slowing down from the week. And then I find just this effortless, deep conversation where I start to kind of tell God the things, the things that really bothered me about the week, the things I wish I had done different, like these confessions from the week start to come about. Um, and then once a quarter, I do a, a two night silent retreat where I just get away um, and I disconnect myself from the world and I try to be with God as just a soul on the journey with Jesus um, and not as uh, not the way that I'm used to coming to God, which is in these finite spaces where demands are awaiting me on the other side, but to slow down enough to have an unhurried extended period of time in God's presence. And all of those are ways that saints have cultivated of connecting with God for hundreds of years that the church of our time is in danger of just entirely doing without if we don't intentionally cultivate such practices. Hmm. You've talked about, you know, silence just now and, you know, kind of waiting in in the silence and stillness of all that. Can you maybe like weigh in on like adoration and and ways that we could engage in that? Um, You mentioned in your book, things like prayer and worship. Uh, worship music and and kind of praying the psalms and those kinds of things. Could you maybe walk us through what you mean by that? Just what I mean by praying adoration? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, tuning my inner life to be in touch with the grandeur of God and not the chaos of a corrupted creation. Um I think we all have a profound responsibility when it comes to our imagination as followers of Jesus, of just what is going to be the dominant narrative of my imagination? Um, Is it going to be the father who loves to give good gifts to his children? 
or the lack that I'm experiencing today? Is it going to be the promise of redemption and the victory of King Jesus? Or is it going to be the chaos that I'm experiencing today and illness in my body and uh, pain from a relationship and, and whatever else it may be? And the primary way that we do that is is through adoration. So I think the the misunderstanding that many people have in prayers of adoration, which is just praising God, it's telling God how amazing he is and how brilliant his promises are and trusting them and trusting him all over again. And like you said, that can be done through praying the Psalms, through praying out scripture, through recalling the promises of God. It can be done through singing out, you know, in many different ways have been cultivated, but we have, I think this default thought, which is obviously false if we play it out, that we're kind of buttering God up before we get to the big asks, you know, like almost like adoration is for God. We need to remind him how awesome he is and just feed him a certain amount of compliments each day. But I would say adoration is for us. It's because if I've not begun my prayers by remembering that God is the fundamental victorious reality of my life and my world, then my prayers are going to flow from my anxiety and my lack, a fading reality that God is bringing to an end, and not from the reality of his generosity and his presence to me. And so before I start asking God for things, uh, before I start processing things with God, I simply need to remember the true reality of who God is and who I am. And adoration is the kind of bucket of prayer practices that we've been given dating all the way back to biblical history of the way that we can do that. Can, can you talk to us a little bit more about imagination? I mean, you mentioned it just now, but that, that, that concept of engaging with your mind, again, we mentioned that a moment ago about images of kind of like meditating upon, um, but like maybe even specifically with the church and how the church historically has has thought about meditation and imagination. Um, you know, I, I think that we think of the imagination in terms of silly fairy tales and letting your mind go wild. Um, but I think that you're speaking of it in a different intentional sort of way. Could you maybe, again, just, just speak a little bit more on how we use imagination as it relates to prayer and worship? Yeah. I'm talking about living in the fear of the Lord and to live in the fear of the Lord is to live this day that I'm living right now. um, Like Jesus really is King and his promises really are true and then acting in kind. And so that means that if I'm interacting with my neighbor later at my son's baseball game tonight, who I've seen expressing increasing interest in Jesus. And there's a little moment that opens up as a portal of vulnerability. I'm seeing that as God conspiring to weave and pull and tug deeper and deeper at his heart. And so I'm stepping into that moment with boldness and excitement and courage rather than timidity, because I actually believe that Jesus is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one. And he is radically in pursuit of this man. And I just so happen to either have a front row seat to it or maybe even be a conduit of that pursuit for a moment. That's the fear of the Lord. And that requires me to have a redeemed imagination where, yes, I'm showing up to my son's baseball game, but there is a cosmic meta story at play, even in this Little League baseball game tonight. And the wonder and joy of my life is to live attuned to it that I might participate within it. So that's the the way that I live there this evening in the hustle and bustle of the everyday is to have regular practices where I'm tuning my imagination to the fear of the Lord or to that story. And, and yeah, that can be done through disciplined, regular practice, like learning to read scripture imaginatively where I am setting my feet next to the river Jordan and seeing Jesus be baptized and the dove descend um, rather than just reading it through the practice of Lectio Divina by returning to the passage again and again, and maybe learning to 
uh, live in the biblical story imaginatively until I can live in my own life poetically and imaginatively and by the fear of the Lord, as I'm describing. And there's a number of practices like that, but Lectio Divina is a great place to start. And the scripture is a great place to start when it comes to uh, redeeming the imagination. Okay, Tyler. So you've obviously been affected a lot by church history and the practice of prayer throughout church history. And, uh, you know, at Render Radio, we talk a lot about church history, but you know, a lot of evangelicals are not very schooled in it. They don't even know where to begin. It's just like a bunch of old dead guys said a bunch of stuff and hard to understand language and like, where do I even begin? And so I wonder if you could talk to us about maybe for starters, some of your biggest influencers on your prayer life throughout church history. Um, and maybe kind of segue that into just what would be your recommendation for an evangelical unschooled in the ways of church history? Like, how do we begin? Is it just read those guys? Uh, give us a little advice on uh, on how to go about growing in our church history, specifically as it relates to prayer. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've gotten to talk to a lot of people about prayer since writing this book. And my, my review on the culture of prayer in the American church today would be this. Most people um, know that they should pray and find it boring. It is uh, very much related to like a child eating their vegetables. It's like, I know I'm supposed to eat this part, but this is the boring part of the meal. Um, And I think that's almost always because people have been taught when, when people hear the word prayer, they think of one practice of prayer when the truth is we have this rich color palette of prayer throughout church history. So painting on a canvas would be quite boring if you only ever had access to the color green. But if you begin to explore that you have all this color and creativity to work with, then prayer becomes this uh, creative process that you get to enter into with God. Um, And so I think, First of all, the why of becoming well-versed in prayer practice throughout church history is so you can enter into the creative process of prayer alongside God and discover the joy and life and power there is there. And then where to start, I would say, don't start by reading those guys. Start by reading people who have read those guys and are translating (laughs) them in a more accessible way. So just to be very prescriptive, I would say, Uh, Water from a Deep Well by Dr. Jerry Sitzer is a phenomenal summary of the different traditions going all the way back to the book of Acts and leading up to today. And what are the different roots? Can we trace the root system of church history and everything that we can maybe garner, um, whether it be through imitation or warning, from these different uh, expressions that have come about throughout church history. And yeah, I would say some of my major influences on prayer um, would be that I think that, I think that I've been very influenced by the vineyard tradition in the U S and the UK, which would be more recent of a posture of waiting on the Holy Spirit, who is always present and learning a posture of waiting and prayer that's been fostered in the Quaker tradition as well. Um, of Maybe the access point to spiritual power not being, I need to hype up this moment, but instead I simply need to wait and become present to the God who is always present to me and who is eager to do more than I could ask or imagine through the simple... Um, through my simple attunement to him through listening and conversation. I've been influenced by St. Ignatius in the practice of discerning God's everyday presence to me and his everyday voice in my life through praying the examine each evening, um, returning to my day, seeing all the places I knew God's presence and all the places I missed God's presence because it's easier to perceive God in hindsight And so if we can learn to notice God in hindsight, we can often then learn to become more attuned to God. 
in the present moment. Um, and, and I think, I think that I've been influenced by honestly, like the first 300 years of biblical history, when it comes to the power of intercession and the necessity of prayer as an incarnational act that I see in the, in the early church years, that prayer is not just uh, something that we say, but ultimately the most powerful prayer is the prayer that we become. And that there are times when God miraculously just reaches into history and brings about supernatural change through just simple conversation with the praying person. But it seems like his preferred method is to reform the heart of the praying person and then send them out in partnership in answer to their own prayer. And, and in this way, prayer should be viewed as risky business. Like if you're to pray for a friend who doesn't know Jesus, don't be surprised if God begins employing you in answer to your own prayer, um, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, so I would say those have been big streams of influence for me. That's great. Yeah. Um, if, if we have time, I'll do one more question uh, for, for on my end, but I'd love to know, uh, you mentioned earlier confession, you mentioned your kind of your relationship with your wife, kind of recognizing may, maybe the way I'm handling this isn't right. Can you maybe tell me like your journey of confession and how the believer's journey of confession, um, how it kind of, I don't know, it grows. I, I think your book, you, you mentioned this, how uh, we mm -hmm. may, and I'm, I'm using my words here, have a, have a view of like vain triumphalism. The longer I'm a Christian, the less I'm going to confess when it seems as if maybe mm -hmm. the opposite's actually true. Could you Could you unpack that for us? Yeah, I think that spiritual maturity is not needing to confess less and less. It's greater freedom to confess. Um, and that that doesn't mean that confession never leads to sanctification, where I grow up in, in Christ and actually do begin to experience victory over certain sin patterns in my life. It just means that um, as God is excavating the layers of my inner life, I stop being embarrassed by the need for His grace and or I stop having a accomplishment relationship to the need of his grace. Like I need God's grace today for this thing, but if I need it for his grace there again tomorrow, then I've failed. Um, but instead, it seems that the redemption of Jesus turns confession into the means of our sanctification, that as we learn to come out of hiding, to take big leaves off of ourselves, to stop presenting and pretending, and start being broken people in need of God, that his grace actually is sufficient and really does lead us to life. And so I would say I feel more freedom to, to honestly be the person trying to walk with Jesus through occasional glorious moments of victory and a whole lot of my intention outrunning my follow through today than I did a year ago, and I hope that I continue to mature into someone whose great fear is not confession, but hiding the need to confess from mm -hmm. God and or the community that can represent God's presence in loving me and my weakness and absolving me. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. Amen. I love that. Everybody loves the idea of confession until they have something to confess. <laughs> sure. Like actually admitting that you did something wrong can be pretty hard, uh, but it reflects a humility that is absolutely necessary. You like talk, you talk about helplessness. It's like all of that fit helplessness, willingness to confess. It all fits under this place of humility where, uh, which is the position we have to be in for prayer. But I'm talking to Noah about the flood here, telling you things you already know. So um, <laughs> why don't we kind of wrap things up here with a little bit yeah. of uh, maybe just, Tyler, if you could maybe give us like a golden nugget. And, and actually, Josh, I, I could start with you. Uh, a golden nugget, a takeaway, a nutshell, whatever you want to call it. But uh, Josh, I'll start with you. And then, Tyler, uh, you could go after Josh. What would be your one take away your one thing that you want people to take away from this conversation josh uh just start somewhere i mean prayer is was one of those things that um they can be like a, a paralysis of analysis let me very get in touch with my pentecostal roots we just kind of overanalyze things until we get everything perfect and then that's when we're going to start when we get 
You know, uh, we got the rhythm figured out. We got the pattern figured out. We've got the Bible verse figured out. We've got that prayer journal. We got the we got 16 different things. Um, you should make a step towards prayer. Um, I think that's the big thing that you've got to do. So we can talk a lot of theory. Um, you can learn all the best practices, but until you start doing it, you you don't you don't know how much of a relationship with God you have until you kind of start. So um, that's as simple as it can get, and it's very anti-Protestant of me. Uh, but go and do it. Like go and do go do work. Um, uh, go pray. Uh, it'll be good for you. I think that's that. Amen. Okay. What about you, Tyler? Yeah, in my book, I reference my personal favorite quote on prayer. It's pray as you can, not as you can't. So I would just say, find a natural pathway between you and God and just walk on it for a while and start there. Like start where you are, not where you think you should be. Don't copy someone else's prayer life or prayer practices and try to imitate them. I, I mentioned, for instance, for me, I'm a kinetic processor. So moving my body while I talk to God tends to produce the most honest and easy prayers between me and God. So I hope that I am taught many practices of prayer by church history, the saints who have gone before me, the brothers and sisters I walk beside today. And I hope that I die as someone who prayer walks with Jesus because that's the way I knew him first. And that's the way I'll always find so natural to keep knowing him. And so Find some practice like that that makes prayer easy for you and just start there and allow God to lead you down other streams from that place. Amen. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for uh, joining us and to all our viewers and those who are uh, listening on to our audio podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, make sure if you are watching to hit that, uh, that like button, that subscribe button. And, uh, and also find the link in the description for our newsletter. That's where you can find out all kinds of interesting things going on with Remnant Radio, whether it be our latest e-course or our upcoming conference. We have a conference coming up uh, in early October. All of the deets on that uh, you can find in the newsletter. Uh, so please, yeah, just click on that, sign up for the newsletter. And, uh, and guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. We we have a podcast, live podcast, every Monday and Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Cent, uh, Central Standard Time. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday talking about the seven spirits of God. What are they? Or what is this? Is it a they? Well, we'll find out on Wednesday. So guys, have a great week. Make sure you pray like a monk and live like a fool. God bless you all.